Please pray with me. May these words I may these words I speak be grounded in my soul, encouraged by the God presence in me. And may these words you hear be captured by your soul, enlivened by the God presence in you. Amen. There has for centuries been much debate about the language Jesus spoke. But we need to remember this as we read our New Testament scriptures. Jesus didn't speak English. Not even King James English. Most scholars suggest he likely spoke a little Greek. There's certainly evidence of that. But his primary languages were Hebrew and Aramaic. Hebrew was the language of the Torah, the first five books of our Old Testament. And Jesus knew Hebrew scripture because he would have been taught that growing up. So he was familiar and conversant in Hebrew. But his primary language would have been Aramaic. This was the language of the people. Why does this matter? It matters because our English New Testament has been translated from Greek, and the words attributed to Jesus are a Greek translation of Aramaic. This is why it is so important for us not to literalize the words of Scripture, but rather to let our hearts guide us to the deeper meanings of those same words. It also means that there are some times when we need to just let go of some of what is said. Matthew Fox, a priest, progressive theologian, and prolific author, says, Scripture must be experienced with the heart and not just studied with the head. When scriptural passages become overly familiar, matters of rote, memorized prayers instead of living words, religion is paralyzed and loses its capacity for transformation. Neil Douglas Clotes, uh, the person that we heard about this morning, an Aramaic scholar, has done extensive work, basically lifelong work, reconstructing familiar Jesus passages like the Lord's Prayer and the Beatitudes in attempt to honor Jesus' Aramaic, Aramaic language roots. We have been using his translation of our disciples' prayer for, for several weeks. And this morning, you heard both the Greek and Aramaic versions of the Beatitudes. Obviously, you heard them in English, not in Greek and Aramaic. Aramaic, unlike Greek, is a more fluid language where one word can have several different meanings. And the intention is to open rather than to nail down meaning, to continue to keep a flow. Greek is more precise, and as a template for Jesus, tends to make his teachings seem more rigid. For example, the Greek, be you perfect, is in Aramaic, be you all embracing. All embracing can mean many, many different things, while being perfect seems nearly impossible for us to achieve. The Greek, to be satisfied, is in Aramaic, to be surrounded by fruit. How beautiful. And again, surrounded by fruit can mean many, many different things. While being satisfied suggests a completed state of being. If we are to grow spiritually, we need to open our hearts and our minds. Rather than clinging to our Father, we need to open to, O oh, breathing life. Not merely to replace, but to embrace the more. To embrace the more. The Beatitudes, which many of us know well, show clearly how meaning differs when comparing Greek and Aramaic. In our English translation from the Greek, I come away with a sense of do this or be this, and you will receive reward from some external source, namely God. Hunger for righteousness, be filled. Be merciful, receive mercy. Be pure, 
see God, be peacemakers, receive title, children of God, be persecuted, go to heaven. In each case, there is an underlying notion of obedience. Do this to attain this. But the English translation from Aramaic feels quite different to me. There is an open-heartedness and an acknowledgement that the transforming spirit is within us. Hunger for justice, find what you need. Birth mercy, feel its embrace. Radiate from a core of love, see God everywhere. Plant peace. Be known as a child of God. Be dislocated in the cause of justice. Find a new home in the universe. When reproached and driven away, find renewal in the spirit within. The beauty and the joy in this for me is that we become one with God by opening, by opening to love, to compassion, to peace, to a yearning for justice, to courage through the Spirit of God within us. It is no longer reward for obedience or punishment for disobedience. It is rather genuine contentment in love. This begins and ends as, and it is in every part in between about being open-hearted. Richard Rohr in a blog, his blog a few days ago said this, and I just love it. See everything. Judge little. Forgive much. See everything. Judge little. Forgive much. We need to move individually and communally from seeing everything as right or wrong, good or bad, us and them, to accepting that everyone and everything is both right and wrong, both good and bad, and all and everything is connected, not separate. Only in seeing in this way can we change ourselves and our world to becoming more obviously children of God. So Roar continues, we are living in exciting times. People might call it something else, but he says, we are living in exciting times where we are teaching people not what to see, but how to see. The broad rediscovery of non-dual contemplative consciousness gives me hope for the maturing of religion and is probably the only way we can move beyond partisan politics. Many are now realizing, he says, that we have been trying to solve so many of our religious, social, political and relational issues inside the very mind that falsely framed the problem in the first place. It is Einstein who said, no problem, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. We need to look at our lives and our world with new eyes. And Jesus said that often. I'm not making this up. He was always saying, you need, you need to see differently. We need to see everything, judge little, forgive much. It is our way, it seems, to see and judge lots. <coughs> to judge as either being good or bad, right or wrong, for or against, but the God Spirit calls us to a different way. See everything. Don't be naive. See everything that's going on in your life and the world. Judge little. Know there is always some right in wrong, or some wrong in right, always some good in bad, or some bad in good. <coughs> Forgive much. It's only when we are open-hearted that we can forgive ourselves and each other and every other. Rohr says, as you spiritually mature, you can forgive your own and other's mistakes. Wisdom emerges when you can see everything. You eliminate none of it and you include all as important training. Finally, 
Finally, everything belongs. You are eventually able to say from some larger place that may surprise you, it is what it is. And even bad was good. At the very heart of all this, and a part that was so foundational in the nature of Jesus, was that constant forgiveness, constant forgiveness is key. Rohr continues, forgiveness is the Christian form of nonviolence. I love that. <laughs> forgiveness is the Christian form of nonviolence. But we never really got good at it because we did not incorporate it as a full and all pervasive philosophy of life. This was, for me, the most profound and central part of the vigil that many of us attended at the Islamic Center in Kelowna this last Tuesday evening. It was, for me and I know for others, a genuine experience of open-heartedness. Love flowed, and a spirit of solidarity in the midst of horrendous tragedy and grief truly, truly emerged. But also, and most profoundly for me, was the call to forgive. That as hard as it may be, we also needed to forgive the perpetrator, and every perpetrator, if we are to be truly present to and living in the God Spirit. Returning hate and fear, for hate and fear only diminishes within us, among us, and beyond us. Returning love and forgiveness when facing hate and fear expands the God presence within us, among us, and beyond us. I left that evening knowing even more clearly that love will always reign. No matter how hard fear and hatred may try to rule in our lives and our world. I want to end with one more quote from Richard Rohr and I end here because for me these words bring this reflection full circle. To be in the Spirit's flow, in love's flow, is to face all of life with an open heart. It is what the Aramaic words of Jesus invite us to be and to do. No literal and singular interpretation, but rather a willingness to embrace the ever-changing more. There is always more. And so Rohr says, Receptive, flowing people are the ones who change the world and transform history. Their possibilities are endless, are limitless, because they do not let any seeming barrier stop their path. In fact, they well up from within until they can surmount any obstacle. Blessed, blessed are those that open to spirit's flow. Blessed are those with open hearts. Amen.